Scholars have tended to focus on specific aspects of John Wesley's educational practice in light of his regime at Kingswood, primarily because of the emphasis he himself placed on the school. My opening remarks when talking about Wesleyan education would generally be to steer the audience away from so narrow a focus. But what an emphasis on the regime at Wesley's boarding school does, however, is give us an opportunity to focus on the effect of his educational model on the lives of adolescent boys and to consider the implications of the Kingswood School rule and monastic schooling. When the foundation stone of the boarding school was laid on the 7th of April 1746, Wesley was choosing geographically as well as educationally to distance his pupils from what he contended were the brutal, godless and classics dominated public schools of his day. That is not to suggest that Wesley's own school days were unhappy. Educated at Charterhouse School from the age of 10, he has been described as unusually well behaved, obedient and of excellent manners. He was instructed by masters with the width and variety of intellectual interests. The schoolmaster, Thomas Walker, was a scholar in Greek, Latin and Hebrew, and the usher, Andrew Took, was not only a classical scholar, but a mathematician and scientist, professor of geometry and fellow of the Royal Society. Despite this, one of the most striking themes in Wesley's educational thinking and practice is a constant tension between academic, academic learning and piety. His primary aim when establishing Kingswood Boarding School was to put in place an educational model that would instill attitudes of piety and virtue in pupils. Their intellectual advancement an important but rather secondary consideration. The monastic ideals of a love of learning and a desire for God resonate in Wesley's thinking that encouraged learning, but emphasized religiosity, arguing that self-denial, introspection and emotion were important features of religious and educational development. Education was not only to be regarded as a training for a life of holiness, but a pathway to the kind of conversion Wesley himself had experienced. Wesley's insistence that masters at Kings would be employed for their piety rather than their academic learning was not without its difficulties. There were few masters who could match his expectations on piety and at the same time have the skills to deliver the level of academic learning he demanded. In addition, teaching posts generally were not well paid. Oliver Goldsmith described in the critical review of the 10th of November, 1759, of all the professions in society, I do not know a more useful or more honorable one than that of a schoolmaster. At the same time, I do not see any more generally despised or so ill rewarded. When Wesley's boarding school opened on the 24th of June, 1748, there were 28 boys and six masters. Pupils were boarded, instructed and clothed. The rectangular three-storey building also housed two rooms, a bedroom and a study, set aside for Wesley to use on his frequent visits to the school. Before being accepted, the prospective pupils were expected to display a desire for salvation and together with their parents to agree to abide by strict rules for the school. Wesley's sermon at the official opening was based on Proverbs 22 verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Charles Wesley composed a hymn, especially for the occasion, which expressed the spiritual aims of the school, that sacred discipline be given, to train and bring them up for heaven by learning and holiness combined. Wesley made it clear that the boy's upbringing at Kingswood was to be at the utmost distance from softness and effeminacy. The manly ideals of endurance and self-reliance were to be built on privation, not softness. He contended that childish play, which would be emulated through leisure in manhood, 
was to be overcome through constant engagement in learning and industry. His attitude was reflected in the hymn written for the pupils by Charles Wesley in 1763, which stated, let heathenish boys in their pastime rejoice and be foolishly happy at play, overstocked if they are. We have nothing to spare, not a moment to trifle away. Although A.G. Ives in his 1970 history of Kingswood refers to the semi-monastic rule at the school, it was not John Wesley's intention to make the pupils miserable. Georgian society regarded effeminacy as the feminizing or weakening of men and the risk to society of boys unable to mature into men of sterling character was regarded as profound. Wesley considered self-denial, virtue and happiness as congruent, arguing that true religion or holiness cannot be without cheerfulness. True religion has nothing sour or steerable in it. Wesley frequently referred to staff and children at Kingswood as a family, believing this to be the ideal environment in which to provide children with the best possible religious upbringing and education. He assumed a position of patriarchal authority over the school, not appointing a headmaster until 1751. The six masters taken on when the school opened were all semi-itinerant, and liable to be taken off by Wesley at short notice to preach elsewhere. Instead, both he and Charles Wesley took responsibility for the early running of Kingswood, even though this was often from a distance. By publishing rules covering every aspect of school life, Wesley made it clear that the management, curriculum and discipline at Kingswood would be exact. Here, as a postscript to Kenneth's paper this morning, it's worth mentioning that there were similarities between Wesley's educational model and the work of the Port Royal Schools, and indeed resident, residences in monastic rules, in that they covered every aspect, including what to eat, when to pray, when to rise in the morning and retire at night. A short account of the school in Kingswood published in 1748 outlined in detail Wesley's regime for the school. Pupils were to be instructed every day of the week except Sunday when there were two public services and time devoted to learning hymns or poems. Arguing that most of the classics usually read in great schools influence the lusts of the flesh, Wesley ensured that such classics as were read at Kingswood were scrupulously edited. While the reading list in the Kingswood rules may appear prescriptive, Wesley wrote following a request from Joseph Benson in 1768, it would not be amiss if I had a catalogue of the books at Kingswood, then I should know better what to buy. As fast as I can meet them at sales, I shall procure what you are wanting. Indeed, Randy Maddox lists among the titles in the library at Kingswood in 1775, the Proceedings of the Royal Society and Benjamin Franklin's New Experiments and Observations on Electricity. Beyond time allotted for instruction, the boys were to be kept constantly occupied, whether at work or leisure. Although the rules specify that this might include walking around the grounds, working in the garden, learning music, or philosophical experiments, the exact nature of this extracurricular activity is uncertain. Hal Harris made reference in a journal entry of the 4th of June 1748 to Wesley's comments at the Methodist Conference of that year and indicated that the boys were to learn butter making or shoe making and the Kingswood School account book dated 1764 to 1770 refers to some pupils learning to paint on glass. While the regime may not have been quite as austere as some scholars have suggested, it is apparent that whatever activity undertaken, a close watch was always kept on the boys. Wesley insisted that they never worked alone, but always had a master with them. Wesley stipulated a plain and simple diet at Kingswood, since he was determined to protect his pupils from the dangers of overindulgence. Indeed, throughout the 18th century, physical self-denial was a practice widely valued as morally beneficial. 
The physician George Cheney, in his popular work Essay on Health and Long Life, published in 1724, argued that the body could be purified by a diet refined to its essentials of milk, vegetables and seeds. Nevertheless, the diet outlined for the boys at Kingswood was not insubstantial, including cold roast beef, hashed meat, boiled mutton and bacon, albeit that Wednesdays and Fridays, as well as the periods through Lent, were designated as days when only vegetables and dumplings would be served. Wesley also stipulated that on Fridays, the boys were to fast until three in the afternoon. Fasting was generally regarded as an indicator of piety and was described by Susanna Wesley as a means of purifying the mind of sin, subjecting appetite to the superior power of the mind and a penance for former excess. During his days at Oxford, John Wesley was often to confess in his diary to overeating. Indeed, he argued, if there are two dishes set before you, by the rule of self-denial, you ought to eat of that which you like the least. And this rule I desire to observe myself. Always choose what is least pleasing and cheapest. Self-indulgence is practised by too many. Wesley was in later life to record that during his time at Charterhouse School, when between the ages of 10 to 13 or 14, he had little but bread to eat and not great plenty of that. Despite appearing to have been a victim of the bullying that was experienced by the younger boys who were deprived of their meat by the older boys, Wesley argued that this experience laid the foundation for lasting health. Pupils at Kingswood were to have nothing to eat between meals. There was no tuck shop, tuck shop at the school and the boys sat together to eat at allotted times during the day. Rather than the small beer provided for most children at public schools, Wesley insisted that the boys drink only water and that only with meals. The evidence suggests, however, that this rule was impractical since there was no well at Kingswood. The scarcity of water meant that a large underground system with a pump supplied the school. This water supply was often inadequate Adam Clark recorded having a meal with masters during his stay at the school in 1782. On being offered beer, he refused and went to the vile straining stone behind the kitchen for some of the half putrid pit water. Clark also stated that there was a pond of rainwater in the garden where he occasionally bathed. Since scant indeed of water, for there is none in the place but what falls from heaven, I was obliged to contend with frogs and vermin of all different kinds. Self-discipline in the form of early rising meant the boys were expected to rise at 4 a.m. both summer and winter and spend an hour in private reading, singing, in meditation or in prayer before meeting together at 5 a.m. for a public service. They were expected to retire early in the evening following a public service at 7 p.m. Boys went to bed from 8 p.m. with the youngest going first. Although the beds had flock mattresses, luxuries such as feather beds were to be avoided. Unlike some public schools where masters left pupils alone at night, Wesley insisted that the boys lodged in one room with a master at each end and a lamp was left burning all night. As the first boarders came from homes of Wesley's friends and supporters, it is perhaps inevitable that, initially at least, pupils responded to the atmosphere of piety and discipline in which they found themselves. Wesley's own analysis of the effectiveness of the school was that some of the wildest children were struck with deep conviction, all appearing to have some good desires, and two or three of them begin to taste the love of God. Although Wesley subsequently recorded that despite the strictness of the school rules, he had as many pupils as he desired, the evidence suggests that his model school was not without its problems. In October 1749, just over a year after its opening, Robert Jones, along with some other boys, ran away from the school. Despite an intervention from Charles Wesley, Robert Jones could not be persuaded to return to Kingswood. 
Charles Wesley undoubtedly supported John's work, referring to children at Kingswood as our children. He was a frequent visitor to the school, teaching hymns to the pupils and taking responsibility while his brother was away. Nevertheless, despite living in nearby Bristol, Charles did not send either of his sons to Kingswood. In 1771, just as John was declaring that the learning offered at Kingswood would advance students more in three years than the generality of students at Oxford or Cambridge do in seven, Charles was moving his family from Bristol to London in order to secure what he considered to be the best possible educational and musical opportunities for his children. Old account books dated 1764 to 1771 held in the Kingswood School Archive make reference to pocket money. Since the pupils were not allowed outside the premises, it is unclear what this money was used for. The account book, together with Arthur Hassling's History of Kingswood School published in 1898 and the engraving of the school by James Heath dated 1790, provide an image of a Kingswood youth wearing a broad brimmed hat, a long tail coat and a pair of knee breeches fastened round the knee by a ribbon, stockings and shoes with buckles. Joseph Benson's letter of December 1766 rather contradicts this. It states, the school is oppressed with debt and several of the children's parents neglect to send them clothes or procure for them anyway, especially Mr. Hampson, who seems to have forgotten his boys. The impact of Wesley's regime was described by Thomas Morris in his poem, The Schoolboy, published in 1775, who wrote of his time there as, a life exposed to all the woes of hunger, toil, distress, cut off from every source of bliss, from every bland amusement want to soothe the youthful breast. Morris, a pupil at Kingswood from 1767 to 1769, found no fault with the running of the school, stating that the presiding classical master, Joseph Benson, was by no means deficient in learning, in talents and in zeal to promote the improvements of the pupils. But Morris criticized those unfeeling friends who permitted me to be sent to such a barbarous place for mental improvement. The habit of early rising and the strict discipline were, he suggested, good and salutary, but he criticized the long prayers, the occasional fastings and restraint from the usual sports of school schoolboys. Of the isolated location of the school, he wrote, Bleak and terrible was the prospect of the barren desert that surrounded us, and the omen, only human beings we beheld or could converse with without the walls of this holy Bastille were the sooty delvers of the coal pits that extended for miles on every side. Two miserable years were passed in the bosom of this howling wilderness, the solitude of which was alleviated only by the occasional visits to Bristol. While Wesley was endeavouring to train his pupils in the necess necessity of leading a serious life, he undoubtedly underestimated the dulling effect of a monotonous routine on youthful minds. He wrote at the boys following a visit to the school in 1765, they are all in house, they behave well, they learn well, but alas, two or three of them accepted, there is no life in them. While the Kingswood School rule and monastic schooling may have had a dulling effect on adolescent boys, Wesley's expectation was that his regime would bring about a profound religious experience. He encouraged masters to supply him with accounts of religious revivals that took place at the school and published accounts in the Armenian magazine. The most significant of these occurred between April 1768 to September 1773, a period which coincided with James Hindmarsh's time at the school. Hindmarsh joined Kingswood in 1765 as writing master and his wife was appointed housekeeper. On the 27th of April 1768, Hindmarsh, by then chief English and maths master, wrote to Wesley advising that on Wednesday the 20th, God broke in upon our boys in a surprising manner. 
The power of God came upon them like a mighty rushing wind, which made them cry out for mercy. About 20 were in the utmost distress. We have no need to exhort them to pray, for the spirit runs through the whole school. The cries of the boys are sounding in my ears. There followed shortly afterwards a letter to Wesley from another master who stated, I have had frequent opportunities of conversing alone with the boys and find the work has taken deep root in their hearts. The whole behaviour of the children strongly speaks of God. Hindmarsh, described by Hassling as the chief agent in stirring up tremendous excitement, wrote again to Wesley, specifically identifying two boys who are, have, have, have apparently been spoken to by God. John Glascott and Thomas Morris rejoice with joy unspeakable, he claimed. While this experience may have had a lasting effect on John Glascott, who was subsequently to become a Wesleyan minister, as we have heard, the joy unspeakable was certainly not Morris's interpretation of his time at Kingswood. The most dramatic revival at Kingswood, however, occurred following an incident on the 18th of September, 1770. On that day, most of the school were taken in solemn procession to view the body of a near neighbour who had died some four or five days before. The children who ranged in age from eight to 14 were unsurprisingly greatly affected by what they witnessed. On their return to Kingswood, the boys were said to be on their knees, praying and crying out in the company of three maids sent to restrain them. This religious hysteria continued from some, for some days, and Hindmarsh, writing on the 28th of September, reported that, Ten of the children quickly gathered around about me, earnestly asking what they must do to be saved. All this time we observed the children who were most affected learned faster and better than the rest. This tension was maintained at the school until some 13 days after the, the incident began, physical exhaustion finally moderated it. Within a year of this in incident, on the 6th of September 1771, Wesley was asking himself again the same questions that seemed to have followed every such revival. What is become of the wonderful work which God wrought in them last September? It is gone. It is lost. It is vanished away. While the reasons behind the periods of religious hysteria may be complex, that Wesley searched for edifying accounts of religious experiences and celebrated their occurrence might suggest that masters keen to please him would encourage rather than moderate such religious fervour in the boys. That the religious revivals appear to have intensified during Highmarsh's time at the school may be significant. On the other hand, it might also suggest that Wesley's expectation that masters could move pupils to experience such religious excitement had intensified during this period. Wesley, despite the many opportunities he had of observing the behaviour of children, appears to have been unaware that in an introverted and pressured atmosphere such as at Kingswood, they might aim to please adults by imitating their words and behaviour, and was often taken aback by the decline that followed a Kingswood revival. Over John Wesley's lifetime, the age and demographic of pupils at Kingswood on the Kingswood School role was broad, and the reasons for enrolment and departure complex. In drawing any conclusions about the Kingswood School and monastic schooling, it is important to recognise that while the regime may have had a dulling effect on some pupils, others were to go on to become preachers within the emerging Methodist movement. Nevertheless, while Wesley remained committed to his educational model and believed his regime would not only advance his pupils academically, but offer them a pathway to the sort of conversion experience he had had, the evidence suggests that dis displays of religious fervour at the school were short-lived. It is impossible to speculate on the authenticity of these emotions, set as they are against a backdrop of the lives of adolescent schoolchildren confined in a semi-monastic environment and aiming to please adults by imitating their words and behaviour. In expecting the children in his schools 
to be as he himself had been, Wesley appears to have overlooked the effect of the Kingswood School rule and monastic schooling on the minds of many of the adolescent boys.